Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the greatest show in the solar system and beyond. This is the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thank you for being there. Thank you for listening, finding, following, sharing to everyone you know. I know that you do that because this is the place where we take adventures through the universe to uncover all of those science secrets that are lurking nearby. Lots to uncover this week. Stuff about the future, things about the past will travel way back thousands of years ago. This week, we will chat to a genius nuclear physicist all about their big breakthrough in making energy. And so we make a little sun in the lab. We do this by using giant lasers. Uh, We shine those onto our target and that heats and squeezes the fuel until we can get to these crazy star conditions and it happens for a a very short period of time and we we get our little burst of fusion energy out our dangerous dan uncovers the secrets of africa's biggest vulture and we'll get a lesson from the smartest school in the solar system deep space high talking about things that fall from the air so if we ever wanted to live on a different planet we'd have to find one with liquid water on it that's right although it's going to be hard to find a place like that the atmosphere on earth is pretty rare actually there are only a handful of other planets that is believed to have similar ones and we'll answer your questions i love that part of the show this week it's all about things that happened in ancient egypt and what goes on in your brain when you sleep it's all coming up in a brand new fun kid science weekly Let's start off the show as we always do with this week's science in the news. Last week, a pretty big asteroid passed by Earth. Hopefully, we're still here. (laughs) Maybe you've heard about this. The bit of space rock was about the size of a bus. It was catchily titled 2023 BY. It whipped over the bottom tip of South America and it came within 2,500 miles of Earth, which is quite a close shave with space rock. And it was only detected a few weeks ago by an astronomer in Russia. I find it, it, it's, it's brilliant to talk about these things when it goes well when we don't find ourselves in some apocalyptic science fiction movie. But I love hearing that stuff is flying all around the place in space and we might not realise what's happening until just a couple of weeks before. I love that even though we know so much about the universe, there's still a lot that we haven't figured out yet. Fantastic. Also, experts have found humans share a common language with apes. Now, we're alike apes in many ways. We share 99% of our DNA with them. We walk upright, we use our thumbs. But also, it turns out, we use movements, we use gestures in a similar way. After studying videos, experts have found that just like you would use arms to gesture to your mate to do something, to go somewhere, to pick something up, apes do the same thing. This is amazing if it means that one day we can properly talk to apes. Maybe not using words and language as we know it but we're quite similar to apes so if we have more understanding of how they communicate maybe that'll help us talk to them and finally this week a rare tree kangaroo has been born at chester zoo here in the uk now it was born in july but after that it disappeared it was rarely seen until the other day when it rose from its mum's pouch. It's a good fellows species of kangaroo. They're very shy. They live in trees. And it now gives zookeepers a chance to study this creature close up. We were talking about the universe earlier on, weren't we? That there's so much we know, but still so much we're trying to figure out. And it's amazing that it's the same with these creatures that are all around us. This incredibly rare, very shy tree kangaroo. We know that they're around, but we don't know too much about them. That's why it's brilliant that we've got one at a zoo in the UK for us to look at more. Let's spin that big old wheel of the A to Z of engineering. We've been looking, listening to this series for the last few weeks, discovering all about engineering, how things are made, what they're made of and who makes them. And we are going through the alphabet. We've got 26 of these to listen to. Uh, A right the way through to Z. We don't go A, B, C, D. Instead, we put that in the hands of Engers, our engineering expert, and spin the wheel to see what type of engineering we're exploring this week. 
Hello and welcome to another Engineering Academy, where we're exploring an A to Z of everything engineering. Let's spin the wheel and see where we're engineering today. Over to our engers to spin the wheel. It's A, and A is for acoustic. Thanks, engers. So, you're probably listening to this program on your radio or smart speaker, or maybe online. And that's thanks to the field of engineering we're hearing about today. And hearing is right at the centre of it all. Acoustic engineering is the branch of engineering dealing with sound and vibration. Acoustical engineers are typically concerned with the design, analysis and control of sound. So that can mean making things heard. On the other side, reducing unwanted noise. So, how do we go about creating sounds like those you're listening to right now? Engers, it's over to you. Well, it's all thanks to pieces of equipment such as amplifiers and speakers. An amplifier takes an input signal from a source such as a laptop, turntable or CD player and creates a larger copy of that signal before sending it to the speakers, which convert the electrical energy of the audio signal into mechanical sound waves which we can hear. The volume control is the final bit of the puzzle. This decides how much of the current is passed through to the speakers. The higher the volume, the louder it is. Wow! So that's how we make things loud. But what about when we want to reduce the amount of noise? You might have used noise-cancelling headphones when travelling or at a concert. They were originally created for pilots to improve their comfort on long flights. And the first consumer versions were also intended for travellers. The technology, known as active noise cancellation, works by using microphones to pick up low-frequency noise and neutralises it before it reaches the ear. The headset generates a sound that's phase-inverted by 180 degrees to the unwanted noise, resulting in the two sounds cancelling each other out. Another place we might want to reduce noise is around construction sites and in factories. Architectural engineers can use sound-absorbing materials and designs to help make workplaces, schools and homes much quieter, which is better for our health. There's a wide variety of materials that are used for soundproofing, from fibre boards and mineral wool to dense foam. As well as in noisy places, soundproofing is also used to improve sound quality in concert halls, and there's one very clever type of design that can remove sounds almost entirely. When we talk normally, sound waves bounce off the surfaces all around us, which means we can often still hear people even if they're in the next door room. But in something called an anechoic chamber, dense foam in spiked and angled shapes absorb the sound waves as they come out of your mouth. So, incredibly, if I was standing right next to you, your voice would sound much quieter. So why might we want to create an environment quite like this? Well, it can be really important when testing audio equipment and also machinery that might be affected by sound waves. Now, we wouldn't be able to hear anything without one, well, two very important things. Our ears. The way we hear is something acoustic engineers take into account when designing ways to make or reduce sounds. Our brains interpret sounds in different ways in different situations. Like when you're at a party, even if there's a babble of voices, you can still have a conversation with someone nearby because your brain is focusing on their words and not other people's. And the way we interpret sounds from different types of speakers can change depending on what else is going on or where we are. These psychoacoustic effects are important factors that engineers take into account. Thanks, Engers. You'll find audio engineers in all sorts of areas, as well as noise control. Acoustical engineering also covers positive sound, things like ultrasound in medicine, programming digital synthesizers, and even things like railway station sound systems, so that people can clearly understand the announcements. The train arriving on Platform 1 is for Glasgow. If you'd like to find out more and meet the team at Marshall Amplifiers, head over to the Fun Kids website. And that's our take on the letter A. It's been awesome! If you'd like to check out some other types of engineering, why not check out aerodynamics, aerospace, architectural and automotive engineering?
Join us again next time to spin the wheel and explore another letter in the A to Z of engineering. Engineer Academy, created with support from the Royal Academy of Engineering. If you would like to find out more about the A to Z, visit funkidslive.com slash engineer. You can hear more from Engers, our engineering expert, at the same time next week on the podcast. Right now, it's time for me to be an expert for you. Every week, I take your science questions, things that you send to me as a voice note at funkidslive.com. It's really easy. We've got this big button. Click record on it. Ask away your question, and then it gets sent through straight to me. And then I love doing this. I get to dig down deep and discover all the secrets of the science you're thinking about. Uh, Let's get our first one this week. My name's Elijah. I'm six years old, and I want to know why Egyptian mummies don't rot. Elijah, thank you so much for the question. Why do mummies not rot? Well, mummies are embalmed, which lets them say preserved for ages. What's embalming? Well, using very special processes, ancient Egyptians would take all the water out of the body. And when we're talking about decay and things rotting, water is really the main culprit. You would catch it red handed because all the bacteria that eats away at everything lives in that water. It gives it a perfect home to grow in. Without the water, there's no bacteria. So they would soak the body in salt, which would take away all of that water. They would leave it there for about 40 days. And then they would stuff the body with sawdust, sawdust coated in special oils, which would help that process, which would keep it clean and not rot. And then uh, the big finish, the final flourish, they would wrap it all up in the bandages that you see that you might dress up as for Halloween. They would wrap it up in those to keep all the air away, which would also help it stay preserved because nothing bad could get in. Now, they did this, ancient Egyptians, because they believed that the body needed to be almost perfect to reach afterlife. And they would wrap up and make mummies of all their ancient pharaohs. And they believed they were very, very important, so they needed to get to the afterlife. Thank you so much, Elijah, a question that took us thousands of years into the past. Let's get on a question now that takes us into something that might happen every night. Hello, my name is Daria. I am nine. And my question for you is, what are dreams? So what are dreams? Well, dreams are stories and pictures that you make in your brain through the night. Something perhaps that happened during the day, stuff you're thinking about, something you worry about, and your brain tries to make sense of them while you're sleeping. Interestingly, you only dream in a part of the night called REM sleep, R-E-M. It stands for rapid eye movement sleep. And that's when your brain is active. For the rest of the time, when you're asleep, it's not really doing much, it's resting. But during REM sleep, it's only a tiny sliver of time you're thinking through a lot. Here's what's amazing. You only dream for about five minutes every night. Staggering, it feels like hours. Here's another thing that's brilliant. When you're dreaming, when you're in REM sleep, a lot of your body is almost paralysed to stop you getting up and you acting out your dreams, which means that normally when you see someone sleepwalking, they're not dreaming at all. Also, your brain fires off chemicals when you're dreaming to make you feel sleepy and happy. And it uses that as like a clearing system, throwing stuff into the recycling bin so you can figure out what's happened during the day. Uh, Thank you so much for that question, Day. If there's something that you want answered on the podcast next week, the easiest way is to leave it as a voice note. Get to funkidslive.com. We've got a big record button there. Bash that and let me know what you're thinking, what your science question is, and I'll answer it next week. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, where we look at the meanest, the cruelest, the most menacing and amazing things that are lurking around the universe. This week, we're heading to Africa to take a look at the largest vulture there. The Nubian vulture is also called the Lapit-Faced vulture, and it's found all over Africa, even flying over to Asia. Uh, They're a huge brown vulture with a small pinkish head. They've got a large, sharp, hooped beak. It's also got folds of skin next to his face, which look like ears. 
Their proper name is Lapet, which gives it its name. And this vulture, it is huge. It's the biggest vulture in Africa. And they're strong. They can tear meat from prey pretty quickly, swooping down. And often, that meat that they're finding is, is too hard for other predators to get at. They might be too weak. Not this vulture. It has it on its own a lot of the time. Now, it is the beast of Africa. It manages to scare off other predators and vultures that might be close, wanting the food that it perhaps wants. This creature can live for about 50 years. It can weigh 10 kilograms. Its wingspan is almost three meters long, and it can fly at 50 kilometers an hour. And because it's a vulture, that means it's a scavenger, like a hyena. So it waits for someone else to do all the dirty work. It hovers over the ground, swooping through the sky. And when it sees prey that has already been taken down by another creature, that's the really hard bit, an animal that's already been killed, the Nubian vulture strikes. It swoops down, huge, threatening, and eats, saying, this is my food, and no one else is having it. They probably don't have that deeper voice. They're vultures with a tiny head. They're probably quite squeaky anyway. Because they're so big and threatening, this creature can even charge down large cats that might come for a snack on its own. A lot of other beasts are terrified of its power, which is why the Nubian vulture goes straight onto our dangerous Dan list. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly this week. Very exciting. We're talking about energy of the future and how it's all coming about. Dr. Annie Critcher is a physicist from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. They join us now. Annie, thank you for being there. Yeah, thanks for having me. We are dialing in to sunny California right now, so I thank you very much. Just let's start off by starting at the basics, although I don't know if we can call it the basics. Just what is nuclear fusion? I can describe fusion and also in the context of fission, which is what people generally think of when, when we refer to nuclear energy. So the, these are ways that we can harness energy from the nucleus of atoms, uh, which can be a very significant source of, of energy output. So if we can do that, um, it can be very beneficial. So you all know that atoms are made up of protons and neutrons in a core called the nucleus so, surrounded by swirling electrons. Um, and first off, fission, which is what we currently are using in our nuclear power plants, is when we have a really heavy nucleus, so lots of those protons and neutrons, and it's a little bit unstable. And then once we feed it a, a particle like a neutron, it immediately uh, becomes more un unstable and splits apart into two smaller pieces. And that's how we get energy uh, from fission. Fusion, uh, on the other hand, is when we smash two light nuclei with much less protons and neutrons, we smash those together and they combine into a, heavy nu a heavier nucleus, which is how we release the energy that way. Um, and the fuel that we use is made up of forms of hydrogen, which is all over the earth and also inside of your body. Um, and so the main challenge here when we're trying to do fusion uh, compared to what we're doing currently, which is fission. So the main challenge here is we need really, really hot temperatures to do this. The nuclei have to be hotter than the center of the sun. <laughs> and this is because we're, we're, we're trying to get um, these two hydrogens, which are both positively charged, uh, that each have one proton. We're trying to get them close enough together to overcome the electrostatic repulsion. So as you know, what do two positive uh, charges try to do? They try to repel each other. And so we're trying to get them close enough that the strong force of the nuclear reaction takes over and that they can fuse together. Together. And that's only doable under extreme temperatures. That's correct. So, wow, it's a lot to get your head around. The, the shortened version, I guess, is fission, nuclear fission, is when you are cracking open uh, the, a, a nucleus and uh -huh. fusion is when you are smashing them together to make something brand new. That's correct. So here's the thing. And I know we're getting into like deep physics, Einstein territory, and we're here to talk about something slightly different. I'm just curious, when you crack open a nucleus and it has this massive expulsion of energy, do you know why that happens? Do we know how this tiny thing can contain so much energy yet? 
Yeah, there's there's the strong nuclear force that binds these protons and uh, neutrons together is is amazing. And when we take specific very heavy nuclei and split them apart, the two pieces uh, that we split apart have slightly less mass than than the initial um, larger nucleus that we split apart. And that slight change in mass um, is converted to energy through Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. But you know E equals mc squared, so this is, and we will get to what you've been making, I'm just interested. E energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. Is that accurate? As in, if you times... That is accurate, As in, that really happens. Or is I thought it was just a way of summing up a a gargantuan figure. But actually, if you times mass by the value for the squeed of light, you get the energy. That perfectly works out. That's correct. That's like magic, isn't it? It is. (laughs) Our hero, Einstein. This guy figured it out like 100 years ago. Just put it all together. Right, anyway, we've heard that breaking open those tiny little things... Uh, can release a huge amount of energy. And we've been trying to figure out a, for a while a way of harnessing that energy for something good, not just using it to destroy and for destruction all around the world. How have you been working on it? What types of experiments have you been doing to try and make energy with nuclear fusion? Um, yeah, so the breakthrough at NIF and kind of what we're doing at NIF, um, it's the first time that we've been able to get more fusion energy out than we needed to put into it to make the fusion. And so we make a little sun in the lab. We do this by using giant lasers. Uh, we shine those onto our target and that heats and squeezes the fuel until we can get to these crazy star conditions and it happens for a a very short period of time and we get our little burst of fusion energy out. You say that you had never been able to make this work before. You had never been able to get more energy than you've put into it and it would be pointless trying to have an energy source that could power parts of the world when you've got to use more energy than you would get out. That would be stupid. So you finally managed to make it work. (laughs) What was the little change that you did? What what was the, the the tiny thing that you tweaked that suddenly made all of your experiments fall into place? It's it's actually, I guess, if you compare it to the last attempt, you could think of the change. Um, it was sort of a tweak on the last attempt. The scientific process is that we start out and we, we try something and it just doesn't work completely. And we have our uh, our like cameras on the thing, and we can see what's going on with with this little tiny star, and we can try to figure out why it's not lighting up. So we take these giant laser beams, we hit a can, the inside of a can, we create a really hot oven inside of that can, and that hot oven is what causes the fuel to kind of to implode first. So like an implosion, like a a collapsing star or something, and then an explosion. Optimize the system so much that when you implode, you get to just the right conditions um, so that it lights itself, so that it self-sustains itself and takes over. And and that's how you get um, the types of energies out that we're getting now. So this really hot star doesn't want to stay hot for very long. It wants to cool itself off very rapidly. What we did in this uh, last attempt is made a change to the how symmetrically we can drive this capsule in. So we're trying to take something the size, think of the size of a basketball, and we're trying to squeeze it down to the size of a pea. It's, it's very difficult to do, too, because you have these laser beams coming into the target and there's plasma all over the place. And so you had to get this oven to be very, very uniform in temperature. So we made changes to the oven to try to get it more uniform so that we could drive this basketball down to the size of the pea and keep it looking like a sphere. You know, a few other tweaks here and there help to keep it more stable. We we uh, struggle a lot with different sorts of like fluid uh, instabilities, kind of like when you you drop um, oil into water, if you, or you have a flow going on, you can see that there's some sort of swirling or instabilities, and so. We're trying to control that as this is all going on. And so we made another uh, tweak to help improve that. And all these things are just uh, with the intent to, how can we get 
the plasma happy enough that it can take over and burn up the fuel before it explodes. Wow. Uh, it's amazing. So much stuff. I like the bit when you talk the bit the bit when you talked about the basketball to a P with massive laser beams really did resonate with me. Listen, so this is an incredible thing that you've done. Uh, a world first. The hope is is that it will, ch- it will change the future. I guess lastly, Annie, how do you think it will do that? How will we take what you have done in incredible labs with brilliant equipment, laser beams, how will we take that and use it to try and perhaps create energy for the world? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, we do have quite a long ways to go. Um, at, at the place where I work, it's a, a basic research facility. So we're not trying to create energy here. We're trying to just get to the right um, conditions that we can study these plasmas and figure out Um, figure out ways to potentially use this in the future. Um, So a lot of development needs to happen for the laser architect to make the laser more efficient so that we don't need to pull as much energy off the grid to get the laser energy that we put onto the target. That's that's one uh, huge savings. And and also being able to fire the laser very rapidly so we can do um, many of these little implosion explosions, these little stars uh, very consistently so we would pulse them. Um, we need target development to make the targets cost effective. Um, we need other engineering development to sort of get to be able to do this at a higher repetition rate is one of the biggest things. Another thing that we're going to continue to work on at the lab here in the research facility is can we increase the fusion energy out even more for a specific amount of laser energy in? So can we get the the margin to get more out versus in? Can we get that up higher? Because that will help a a reactor design. Um, And we'll also use uh, the plasmas we're creating, the stars we're creating in the lab right now. Um, We can study them. We can push them, prod them, squeeze them, dud them, and we can figure out where are the sensitivities so that we can make a future, uh, a future plant more robust and, and working more properly. There's also a variety of different ways to do this, to create these plasmas. And this is a proof of principle that it can be done. There's nothing really fundamentally limiting us. And so um, now we can take some of the other concepts that might be better suited for a reactor and see do those work in the same way we can do scaled tests of those here so there's quite a bit of work that still needs to be done and there's a lot of investment now in the the public and private sectors um, and at these research facilities to do this and so it's the beginning of a long road well we've made the first steps and that's what really really counts it's been a a, a joy it's been a hard to get your head around joy i've enjoyed every second dr addy critcher thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me let's finish off this week with a lesson at the smartest school in the solar system we're heading to deep space high right now to check up with professor pulsar Uh, I love heading up to Deep Space High. I mean, it's an exhausting journey traveling there on the rocket to chat to Professor Pulsar to hear from Sam, but it's worth it. In Deep Space High, there is this huge window. It's a massive panoramic window and it looks down slap bang onto us here on planet Earth. They must have the best view in the solar system. And because it looks down onto Earth, It knows all about our planet. This week, we're learning about the different types of water on Earth, which includes what ice, steam, and even snow. Deep Space High, Earthwatch, with support from the Royal Astronomical Society. We can't get on with our Earth watch trip because it's tipping down. You're showing a severe lack of imagination there, Sam. This storm gives us a great opportunity to think about one of the most precious substances in the universe, liquid water. Doesn't feel very precious, just feels cold and wet. Let's get indoors. 
Liquid water covers over 70% of the Earth's surface. Without it, there wouldn't be much life on Earth. So, if we ever wanted to live on a different planet, we'd have to find one with liquid water on it. That's right, although it's going to be hard to find a place like that. The atmosphere on Earth is pretty rare, actually. There are only a handful of other planets that it's believed have similar ones. Why do you keep saying liquid water? Are there other kinds? Oh, hang on. Steam from a kettle is water, isn't it? Yep. Technically, that's water vapour, but you get the idea. Or maybe you fancy a nice cold drink, maybe with some ice cubes in. Oh, right. Ice is water too. Just solid, not liquid. That's right. Same molecule, H2O. There's another solid type of water, one we all hope we get at Christmas. Snow. Oh, I feel sorry for other planets not having snow. Hey, who says they don't have snow? Well... If other planets don't have liquid water on their surfaces, how can they have snow and ice? Water is only a liquid at certain pressures and temperatures. The conditions on Earth are just right for it to be liquid, but on other planets the conditions may only be right for water as ice. Did you know that comets are thought to be massive hurtling blocks of ice? Mars also has water ice at its poles. You may also find snow made of water on some planets. But no watery rain? Well, I suppose that's good in a way. At least I can leave my umbrella at home if I go visiting other planets. Not so fast. You do get rain on other planets, but it may be made of other liquids. Seriously, yucky liquids. On Venus, it rains acid that would melt your umbrella before it melted you. On Saturn, its storm clouds are loaded with ammonia, a poisonous and very smelly chemical. Maybe the storm here on Earth isn't so bad. Hey, here's a joke for you. What goes up when the rain comes down? An umbrella. That is terrible. If you carry on telling jokes like that, I think I'll go and stand in the storm. It'll be more fun. Deep Space High, Earthwatch, with support from the Royal Astronomical Society. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash deepspacehigh. That is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If there is a science question you want answered, make sure you leave it as a voice recording, a voice note, which you can send to us at funkidslive.com. Head there, we've got this big record button. Bash that, let me know your question, and I'll sort it out for you. Uh, Also, we have another bonus podcast, which is full of your questions. We're bringing out a new one this week. And we do one every month. The only way that you can listen to those is by subscribing to the show at Fun Kids Podcast Plus. Find out more about that on the website. Uh, We've got loads more brilliant series that you can hear on Google, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. They're on the free Fun Kids app too. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen all over the country on your DAB digital radio on that free app and at funkidslive.com.